My name is Sean Brennan. I'm currently working on a project in Lanarkshire uh, on a clinical portal which straddles primary care, hospitals and community. And anyway, um, I was reminded when we were talking about watches, watches say so much about people. Mine's old, knackered, the face is a bit tired, uh, it's a bit fatter than perhaps it should be, and um, it's easy to wind up. And I tell you, I'm really wound up at the moment because we're going, we're going live on Monday. <laughs> so I thought a trip to Silverstone would help. I was doing some work on the Isle of Man, and um, um, I, I, I don't know if you've ever been on one of these island hopper planes, you know these little ones? And you're frightened to stand up in case it tips, so you can't go to the loo because you're frightened of it going, Whoa. so you kind of sit there like that. And I saw this in-flight magazine, so I kind of gingerly leant over and plucked it out of the seat. And I read this article about the cows on the Isle of Man have been computerized. And I thought, wow, I've got 23 minutes left of this flight, let's read it. And so I read this story, and it's a true story. And this is the... Um, machine. Now, I don't know if you've ever been a farmer or if you've ever milked a cow, but cows get really quite full of milk and they get really uncomfortable. So farmers milk them twice a day, five o'clock in the morning, five o'clock at night. At five o'clock in the morning, the cows are there like this at the gate with swollen udders in pain going, oh, where is he? Where is he? So what they've done is, in the, in the Isle of Man, in this farm, they've computerized the cows. They've given them a little chip on their ear. They can go and get milked whenever they want. And because of this comfort factor, cows kind of stroll up and go, hmm, I think I'll go and get milked like this. So they stroll over into this machine called Merlin. You might think you're in the wrong conference here. <laughs> I'll show you some brilliant photos of boots. I've got the boot of a Ferrari, I've got the boot of a <laughs> Renault, and the rear wheel of something else, I don't know what it was. Um, so anyway, there's this machine called a Merlin milking parlor. And what it does is it has a food hopper, and Daisy's got a chip in her ear, and so she strolls over thinking, hmm, bit hungry, could do with being milked as well, strolls over to this gate, and it says, hello, Daisy, come in. And so the gate lets her in, and she goes into Merlin, the milking parlor, and the food hopper lid pops open like that, and she goes, hmm. And she strolls over to this food hopper, and when she bends down like that, the gate shuts behind her, and these things come up between her legs like that. <laughs> well, she's quite hungry, so she just carries on. Now, the thing is, you can check this after. Go online and check Merlin Milking Parlor. Truth, uh, cross my heart and all that stuff. Um, so she's there being milked. The, the um, teat things um, are laser guided because every cow's udder's configuration are different. So in order to get these suction cups in the right place, and there's a video. <laughs> I hope nobody checks my history. Um, <laughs> there's a video of these cows being milked, and you can see this laser red light thingy going like that, and then next minute, like that. Anyway, so Daisy's there being milked, and milked, and, and eating. Uh, and then it'll start sucking. Now, when you used to, to milk cows, um, you put these four teeth things on, and you just suck and suck and suck, until eventually the cow goes like that, Thank you very much. <laughs> Completely empty. Now, with this, it measures the milk flow across each of these four teats. And when the milk flow stops, it stops sucking. And it just carries on with the other three, etc. And this is the clever bit. It does a conductivity across the milk flow. And if the cow's got mastitis, it knows, and it sends the farmer a text message, and he's still in bed. And I'm reading this and thinking, what's this got to do with EPR? Anyway, um, and you're probably thinking the same. This is Daisy, and she has got a little chip, and this is the gate that allows her in. And then when she gets in, she goes into the milking parlor, the food hopper opens up, and then milks her, 
And then, if she's got mastitis, then it won't let her back into the field. It puts her into quarantine until the farmer gets out of bed. Fantastic. Now, Daisy, as I said, has got the ear chip. Now, Bluebell has got sensitive ears, so she went for a necklace chip. <laughs> and Buttercup went to the Isle of Kos and came back with one of these. I made that bit up. <laughs> now, you're probably thinking, what's this got to do with anything? Um, nothing. There you go. Um, no, actually, the serious point is that you end up with an electronic record of Daisy the cow. You get a record of her milk yield, her mastitis, her weight. That was a pedometer, so how much she's walked. Uh, at the end of it, you end up with an electronic record of Daisy the cow. And you didn't get that, that's the mastitis there, you didn't, as you all know, you didn't get that from a group of farmers sat round a table saying, oh, or, we could do with having an electronic record of Daisy the cow. You got that from farmers saying, I could do with a lion in the morning. I could do with some help with my milking process. And that has got to be the fundamental driver behind the e-health agenda is about supporting clinicians. If you support them in what they do, then what they've done is automatically captured. And that's the subtle difference. That's where the national program focus was wrong because they focused on the output. They focused on creating a national record. Duh, don't. Focus on delivering local systems that support doctors and nurses and make their lives better. And then you'll end up with a record anyway. So that's what those words say. Uh, so why do we need to change? Technology, if you do that, if you support the way that clinicians work, you can then influence the way that they work. You can then say, ah, actually, you don't need to work like that anymore because in, in the olden days, so my mother used to tell me, there was a program called Dr. Finley's Casebook. And the world has moved on since then. If you look at how busy the world is now, we are going to spend £2,000 every second in the NHS. That's £6,000 we've just spent. That's £10,000 we've just spent. It's a really, as you know, busy organisation. It's, it's a hugely complex organisation. Today, in one day, we will spend £10 million settling litigation claims. This isn't even missile payment protection stuff. This is litigation because of... Uh, complaints against the service. So when you start looking at uh, using technology, we should be using technology to influence and change the way that care is delivered and improve it. If it doesn't improve it, don't bother. Don't buy computers for the sake of it. Don't buy technology for the sake of it. Only buy stuff that is proven to work and it demonstrates that it will improve care. Dr. Finlay was the young GP. I used to mirror myself on him. I now mirror myself on him. He's Dr. Cameron. He was the practice grumpy doctor. And this was Janet. He was, she was the housekeeper. Keeper, keeper. She probably made lemon drizzle cake and all that kind of stuff. Brilliant. But in that day and age, it was dead simple. If I got ill, I went to see my family doctor. It was always the same doctor. Always saw me. Always gave me a lollipop. And always tapped tapped me on the head and said, there, there, there. I said, I'm 18, I don't think this is appropriate anymore. But anyway, in that day and age, I went to one hospital. I went to Bolton General always, because I lived in Bolton. Where else would I go? So the model was dead simple. And you had a paper record. You had a paper record here, and you had a paper record here. And it worked, fine. It doesn't work anymore, because the, the, the NHS is just so complex that you can go and get care in lots and lots of places. You can go to hospitals all over the show. You can call in Scotland NHS 24 or here NHS Direct. Wherever you hit the service, they've got to know a bit about you and they've got to record what they've told you to do. So you can see that there's a real issue here about where is the record. If you look at the IT systems that underpin all that, it, in my particular project, We've got lots and lots of different systems that have all got information about the patient. No longer can the consultant go to the case note and say, this has got everything I need, because it hasn't. Because we don't even print lab reports off anymore, 
in some places because they're on the computer. So you can't even say, I've got everything I need here. There's a real issue around where is the, the record. And when you look at putting in whatever technology, you've got to pull together information like that. And that's what clinical portals are all about. I wanted to, I've got 20 minutes left. I wanted just generally to talk about why we should bother doing this. I'm not a, 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 an anoraki nerdy person. Well, well, I'm not an anoraki person anyway. Um, I come from pathology originally and then clinical audit. I don't come from techie stuff. I don't understand gigabunks. I don't even want to know web services and all that stuff. Um, but the benefits of using technology have been well documented. And I wanted just briefly to just remind people of what those benefits are. Access to clinical knowledge. If you imagine you're a doctor and you have to remember absolutely everything about your specialty, it's impossible, the number of journals that come out every month. Uh, access to the patient's information across the patch. Look at the Victoria Columbia and Baby P um, public inquiries. We were rubbish at sharing data. We're rubbish at sharing information. And you know, we, we should do something about that. And I think there's a real issue there. Better communications. We've already heard about letters between GP, and I'm going to show you a few more. Uh, decision support. Let's just have a quick look at one or two of these. I used to have a, um, a, um, an article in a journal, and it was, it was called EPR being the electronic patient record, and it was called Down at the EPR Arms. It was an imaginary pub in my mind that I used to go to every month, and I'd meet doctors and nurses, and I'd just write this You'd call it a blog these days, but it was an actual article. So if you searched on Google for EPR arms, you would find a number of things. You'd find here, down at the EPR arms, Sean Brennan something, something, something. But you'd also find this. And this is the Mexican EPR, which is a bit like the IRA. So when you search for EPR arms, it looks like you're gun running across America to Mexico. And that's the problem, that instead of getting what you want, and, and it's, we're becoming swamped with knowledge and information that you have to wade through. How many people go past the first couple of pages? You know, you look at the first two pages and think, oh, I'll make one of those fit. Um, cure for cancer. If you looked at the cure for cancer, the cancer, the cure for cancer has been known for years. You heard it here first. Apricot seeds. You think that uh, if that were the case, then we would have heard about that. Um, the cure of the cancer. The cure and the cause of cancer is within you. I think the last thing you want to hear when you've just been told that you've got cancer is it's your own fault. The internet is absolutely brilliant at providing information. It's equally absolutely rubbish because it just it gives you lots of guff in and amongst. And what you need is a process to, to kind of consolidate, to validate knowledge. Meaningful communications. Technology can improve the way we communicate with GPs and GPs with hospitals. Remember, as a hospital doctor, I need to start my process, my thinking, with a referral letter. It starts off the episode. So a useful referral letter is good. Dear colleague, pain in chest since long time. I think there might be something wrong with him, hoping your kind attention. Doesn't exactly fill you full of clinical knowledge. Dear another GP to outpatients, dear Dr. W, regards Mrs. W in Bradford, please see and advise. The reply was, I have seen your patient, I advise you to do the same. <laughs> I am apparently referring this patient to you, unfortunately I can't find any records as to why, but I'm sure you'll find out. <laughs> Can you imagine getting that referral through the letterbox? Hmm. Big heart, second opinion, please. Anyway, and it's not that the GPs are rubbish and the hospitals are great. Hospitals are equally rubbish at sending communication back. At best, you get a scribbled second or third copy immediate discharge letter, and then eventually you get another letter a couple of weeks later. Not helpful. Technology can improve communication. I think we just need to, to, to remember that. Reduce eligibility. Back in 1992, the Medical Defense Union said doctors should write in capital letters because otherwise it's dangerous. And it is. If you've seen many examples of this, this is an audit done. You won't be able to see it there. Actually, you can't see it here either. Um, but the, the, that there could either be 
40 milligrams, 10 milligrams, or 110 milligrams. And they did an audit of all the staff in the hospital and said, what do you think this is? And it was just random. Technology can improve that, so we need to work through that. Decision support. It's very complex. I mean, the, the number of meds that a patient comes in on now is frightening. All elderly people are on 10 plus meds, and the chances of interactions and all that is, is huge. Um, and the, the problems that we've got with medication errors and problems aren't just about drug-drug interactions. Some of them are the drug companies who insist on having a corporate image, and therefore all drugs should be called the same-ish and just change a few letters. And that's dangerous because you pick up the wrong drug and you give the wrong drug. Um, they're all, they all look the same. So, I mean, there are other factors. Useful warnings. If you've got a prescribing system in place, then a warning that says the drug you're about to give the patient will react with one that they're already on. That's not a bad warning. That, that's quite good. The dose you're about to give this patient is, is incorrect for their age or for their body mass. The number of children that have been killed because of adult doses of morphine, for instance, can be avoided if you've got technology underpinning that clinical process. I just put a few more examples in, just really to, um, on the bottom of Coke bottles, it says open the other end, which is not quite useful warning. On Sainsbury's peanuts, warning contains nuts. And on Marks and Spencer's bread and butter pudding, uh, the product will be hot after heating. <laughs> that came about because of the lady in America that went to McDonald's, got a cup of coffee, Put it, put it between her legs in the car, set off driving, scalded her thighs and, and sued McDonald's. And McDonald's had to pay out because it never said anywhere that the coffee was hot. And that's why now everything you get has got hot all over it. On a Swedish chainsaw, do not attempt to stop chain with your hands or genitals. I don't know. <laughs> I have not a clue. <laughs> it gets dark early, I think. Warnings, caution, this sign has got sharp edges. Oh, beware, the bridge is out ahead. We're, we're in this litigious society now where we're more worried about being sued than we are about the, the, the information we want to give. The, the, the reason behind this series of slides is that technology can give you warnings, but after a bit, you just kind of say, yeah, okay, and you just get a blasé. If, if you're typing away and, and comes up with a Microsoft uh, Word Windows that says, I'm going to delete all the documents you've ever written. And you click, OK, fine. Ah! Um, you get blasé about it. I, I see this sign every, every Monday when I drive up to Scotland on the M6. And I'm driving there thinking, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to get my camera ready? Or I said this at one conference, and somebody said, you're supposed to slow down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, not thought of that. Um, or are they just bragging that they've got deer and we don't have where we live? You know, it's just, the thing is, I don't see that sign anymore. I know that's a huge one. It's right in the middle of the road, but I drive around it. But I don't see it anymore because my mind has got so tired of seeing. And that's the problem with technology giving you decision support. Junior doctors will, will see warning after warning after warning. Click, that's fine. Click, that's fine. You need to then build in, as they have in Birmingham, or as we sometimes say, Leeds. Um, <laughs> They say that, uh, are you really sure about this? And you click yes, and then you say, well, what's your PIN number? What's your GMC number, whatever? And suddenly they go, hmm, let me think about this. So we need to work through. Technology is brill, but uh, sometimes you get too much warnings, too many warnings. And what's that about? <laughs> I don't know whether that is... I don't know whether that's a crocodile at the bottom, or, or is it that they've come out the wheelchair? I don't know, but anyway. So, we kind of acknowledge that technology could be good, supporting the clinical care process. We need to look at how we can break down that barrier between the clinician and the technology. Uh, and there are lots of different ways that you can do that. Um, Touch screens, we're now so used to iPads and other devices. Uh, we're so used to that kind of technology. Uh, mobile technology, it's got to be mobile. The clinician needs to have access 
to the system, whatever, where they're do seeing the patient. So it needs to be mobile. Attempts have been made with handwriting recognition. Doctors, handwriting recognition, hmm, let me come back to you on that one. Uh, OCR forms, actually there's nothing wrong with paper. You know, th there may be cases where you could still justify paper and scan it in and OCR it, but digital pens, and what the focus today is, I put at the end there, because you're gonna be hearing more from other people about that, is the digital dictation. If you're gonna capture clinical data in a paperless world, digital dictation is just the start of it. Once you've done that, once you've captured that, you can do all sorts of things with it, including the speech recognition, including, including changing workflow, et cetera. So, um, touch screens for patients. This is, sadly, this picture was 10 years ago when I worked with um, a French company um, in whenever it was, 2000 something too. Um, and here's the consultant doing a ward round with a, a bit fatter, Hand, a tablet than we, we can see these days, but they had six of these on each ward and they had four workstations on a ward. And the junior doctor and the nurse and the patient, and he's just said, well, you seem to have come through the anaesthetic okay, you should be going home tomorrow. I think your duck's dead. Uh, because if you look at the drip, it, it appears that the drip is going into the duck. But anyway, <laughs> I, I digress. Now, there's a shock. Uh, technology. Um, we need to make it simple to use, intuitive to use, mobile. Lots of, lots of examples, um, and I won't bore you with that. OCR, good for stuff. Digital pens. I've done a piece of work on digital pens, and I, I, I'm not absolutely sure yet which is the best technology for people. Digital pens may well have a role somewhere. It may have a role where you have to leave the paper where it is in the patient's home. It might have a role there that you transmit what you've written electronically and it gets integrated into the record. That might be where that sits. If, for instance, I've got a bunch of heart failure nurses, not personally, I mean, I'm working with them, and they have a digital pen that they're trialing, but they bring the paper back to base, and you think, why didn't you just OCR it in? Did you need to transmit it electronically? So I think there will be, um, is that better? I think I might have gone a bit faint. Right, so the digital pen works like this. You write on structured forms and you um, transmit what you've written electronically to be integrated with your electronic record back at base. If you look at the form, the form has got this special paper and it's special because it's got dots in it so um, whatever you write on there gets associated with the NHS number that you've written on first you can tick a box two weeks later and it'll update that same patient and the dots are unique anyway that's we're not talking about that today digital dictation started off as we've heard um, usually in the quieter professions where you do the speech recognition next to um, a PC, so radiology, histopathology, etc. But it's, the technology is changing so rapidly that that is the next big jump. And I think that there's great opportunities in health for using speech recognition over the next few times, few years. The real problem we've got, no matter how good technology is, is we've got to change the way that people work. And changing the way that people work because of the technology and the opportunities that allows you um, is difficult. I don't know if you've ever been to one of these Andalusian villages up in the mountains in Andalusia or Spain. Um, and the, if you go at night, you can see these little fires everywhere. And what it is is that they're setting fire to charcoal. And it's in this thing called a brasero. And they wait until it's white hot and, and stop smoking. And they bring it back into the house and they then put this little cover over it like this and they put it on a base and slide it under the kitchen table. And they do that so that all the family come round and they sit around the table and they've got warm legs. And so they've been doing that for years and years and years. So then they invent electricity. And the first thing you think of is, hmm, underfloor heating, fans, radiator. But no, no, they made an electronic brasero that they shoved under the table and warmed their legs. And this is where 
the technology allows them to rethink the way that they do things, and they haven't. And we need to make sure that whatever technology we put in place in the NHS is an enabler to have a rethink about the way that care is delivered. Otherwise, you're going to have a real problem. And the problem that I had was when, when we moved from uh, typewriters to word processors. And you can talk to the secretaries till you're blue in the face, but it is a different way of working and it takes some getting used to. So in summary, lots of different ways. Technology is really good, but there needs to be evidence that it improves care. That's the driver for us, that it actually does improve things. There's lots of different ways in which we can use technology to improve that interface between the clinician and the computer. Digital dictation and speech recognition are two of those pieces of the jigsaw. So we need to go back to Daisy the Cow and remember that if we support clinicians in what they do, then what they've done will automatically become the record. You can then use technology to influence the way they work. Lots of benefits of using technology, and there's many, many different tools. And I hope that's been okay. Thank you.